Good evening, everyone. I am Alan Kersner, director of the Temple University Entrepreneurship Academy, Focus on facilitating entrepreneurial thinking and doing across the university. It is my pleasure to welcome you to part three of the fourth annual Social Entrepreneurship Summit. It's been a very inspiring last hour as we saw our Changemaker Challenge winners announced, and then we all spent time with organizations making an impact at the Changemaker Showcase. After the panel, you will again have a chance to meet with organizations, to meet with several of the contestants in Changemaker Challenge, and also to speak to the three panelists today. We are thrilled now to talk about our next event of the summit, Reimagine, Design, Rebuild, utilizing local resources to create a more thriving and equitable Philadelphia. To begin, I am honored to turn things over to Dean Ron Anderson of the Fox School of Business for opening remarks. Ron? Thank you, Alan, and welcome and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. As Alan said, my name is Ron Anderson, and I'm the Dean of, Fo of Temple University's Fox School of Business and our sister school, the School of Sport, Tourism, and Hospitality Management. Tonight, we mark the fourth annual Social Entrepreneurship Summit, a university-wide event and one of the premier events of our Innovation and Entrepreneur Institute. And I know that's a mouthful, so we just call it IEI around Temple. You often hear the phrases like, be the change you want to, want to see in the world or change for the better. Events like tonight's ensure these words are more than just cliches. This series of events today provide the information, insights, and, con and connections to empower and enable all of us to make a difference and create social good. I'd like to offer my congratulations to the Temple students an alumni finalist of the Changemaker Challenge. But I also want to offer my congratulations to all of the contestants. That was a really an amazing event. And I thought your ideas and innovations were so cool. I want to offer a very special congratulations to the challenge, challenge winner, Chloe Hill, and her venture, Firefinder, which could play a key role in helping us combat forest fires and wildfires. I'm I am pleased to see the continued growth in this program and that eight schools within the Temple University community were represented in the submission pool. With more than 50% of submissions coming from individuals of underrepresented or minority groups, we are truthfully committed to DEI. Many of you just came from our virtual showcase where we highlighted some of the organizations within Temple University and the Philadelphia community that work to create real tangible change. It provides a great opportunity for all in attendance to learn where and how they too can make an impact. And we invite you to join us for another opportunity to meet with these organizations after our panel event, moderated by Fox Schools, Marilyn Anthony. Today's, today's panelists include Diana Lind, Omar Blake, and Heather Merold Tomlinson, three local leaders in the area of social impact and social entrepreneurship. During their talks, they'll outline some of the most pressing social issues facing Philadelphia. They also offer guidance on how we can all do our part to help create a more thriving, equitable community. I want to thank them for joining us this evening. With that said, I'd now like to turn things over to Professor Marilyn Anthony to continue tonight's events. Marilyn?
Thank you, Dean Anderson and Professor Alan Kersner, committee chair and the lead inspirer for the Changemaker Challenge event. Welcome guests on this snowy afternoon to an hour of conversation with three bold local innovators in areas of critical importance for everyone, housing, food, and an inclusive society. Our panelists are based in Philadelphia, but their research and work have implications for all Americans. Joining us today are Diana Lynn, Executive Director of the Arts and Business Council in Philadelphia and author of the new book, Brave New Home. Heather Thomason, founder and CEO of Primal Supply, a woman-owned butchery providing premium quality, local and sustainably raised meats to Philadelphians. And Omar Blake, CEO and co-founder of U3 Advisors, a consultancy based in West Philadelphia, serving clients across the US. We'll start off our panel by hearing briefly from each of our panelists. Then you'll be able to have your questions answered by our guests. So please add your questions to the Q&A tab on your screen at any time during the event. It's my pleasure to introduce Diana Lynn. Diana, please join me on stage. And while we're waiting for Diana to join, uh, let's also invite Heather Thomason to the stage. Hey, Heather. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah. It worked. And, uh, and waiting patiently in the wings, Omar Blake, please join us on stage. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to give Heather, a, I'm sorry, give Diana a second here, maybe a little technical difficulty, but um, why don't we get started? Great. Oh, here we go. Hey, Diana. Sorry about that. No worries. We, we knew that something was going to happen, right? <laughs> if that's the only glitch we have, we're good. Okay. So we're going to start off with you, um, Diana. Uh, the New York Times described your book, Brave New Home, as, quote, one of those invaluable books that offer a new revelatory window on an old familiar problem. What, what prompted you to write a book about the past, present, and future of housing in America? Um, thanks so much, Marilyn, and I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, so uh, I decided to write the book um, because I really wanted to explore um, some of the problems in our country, um, looking at, you know, why is our country so segregated? Why um, do we have uh, so many people struggling to make ends meet? Why do we have um, a mental health epidemic? Um, why do we have such high rates of obesity? Um, all of these problems that are not shared by um, many other developed countries. Um, what, what is unique to the United States that is causing these problems? And I really felt that um, that the issue of housing and the type of housing that we've built in this country um, was really at the root of these issues. Um, so I wanted to um, look at what, what type of housing we've had in the US and um, how they've evolved over time and really how they have created some of these social, economic, and environmental um, problems. And, and what I found in looking at that um, is that, you know, the United States, like many other countries, um, has not always had a um, sort of uh, a built environment filled with single family homes. Um, we used to be a country of many other types of housing, multifamily buildings, um, shared living situations, um, uh, boarding houses, um, uh, apartment hotels, um, you know, gender segregated types of housing, worker housing, and so on. Um, but that these types of housing have sort of um, slowly 
um, disappeared from our communities um, and in many cases become illegal. And so I wanted to explore that history and then also look to the future of how might new approaches to housing help solve some of these um, problems in the US. And in many cases, actually, some of the new solutions like say co-living or um, accessory dwelling units or um, uh, communities centered around health um, issues. These kinds of communities often have roots in old types of housing that had existed once in the past. So um, I really wanted to bring to light some of these um, ways in which housing is connected to so many other societal um, problems that we're trying to solve and to show what some of those new solutions might also look like. That's great. Um, we're going to come back to you and, and go a little bit deeper into what you found through your research, because there are many surprising uh, revelations there. Um, Heather, turning to you now, uh, butchery and, and meat cutting have traditionally been a male dominated profession. So I'm sure many people are curious how you got involved in the industry and, and what the mission is of Primal Supply. Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I, um, it was really farming that brought me to butchery. Um, I was not, this is my second career. Uh, I was, um, I'm a trained graphic designer and I worked as a graphic designer uh, and even started my own design firm for the first like 10 years of my professional life. Um, and during that time, I was just a very avid home cook and I was really involved in my local food community, which at the time was in Brooklyn, New York. Um, just, you know, I was a member of a food co-op, I joined CSAs, I shopped at the farmer's market. And, um, you know, in doing so, as a consumer, you know, there were there was just sort of, there were things that I wanted that I didn't have access to. And, and mostly that was more variety, better access and fresh availability of pasture raised meat. And, and there was a small, you know, I could find it at my co-op, there was one farmer at the farmer's market that sold it. And as I started to kind of get more involved in the community, and, and befriend some of the people who were sort of growers and makers, I started to learn just essentially how broken the supply chain was, is, uh, that connects small farmers to consumers. So, so anybody else like me that was looking to find, you know, fresh pasture-raised meat, grass-fed beef, um, things like that, you had really limited options and primarily it was farmers selling it out of coolers frozen at the farmer's market. And when I started to get to know those farmers, I learned that they had so many challenges working with slaughterhouses. You know, they, they have to, um, per the USDA and federal regulation, if you want to sell, if you want to take, raise an animal and you want to sell it to multiple people, it has to be harvested and processed under USDA inspection through a federal federally inspected slaughterhouse. There aren't that many of those, you know, as the, the food system has industrialized and, and centralized um, there's very few of those in rural communities around the country and the number of farmers needing to access them, um, they're, they're continually overbooked and um, just, you know, the services that they offer, they're not, they're not able to customize them. So if a farmer who, um, you know, like my friend Ray, who was a farmer at my farmer's market who I bought pork from, he, he grew vegetables and um, twice a year he brought in a litter of pigs from his brother and he raised them with, you know, compost and scraps from the farm. And in order to get them processed, he would have to book his slots at the farmer's market or sorry, at the slaughterhouse six months to a year in advance, um, which meant that he wasn't bringing those animals in when they were proper, finished, raised, ready to harvest. He was bringing them in on a calendar date. So they might be, they could be two months late and really fat, or it could be not, you know, maybe there was some bad weather and the animals didn't grow fast enough and they're just not ready, but he had to go on that date because it was use it or lose it. And then the processor would, would uh, not only harvest the animals, but also cut and package them for him. And, you know, he had to just kind of pick off of their cut list. And the couple of cuts that his customers at the farmer's market never wanted, never bought, just ended up in the bottom of the freezer every time with no outlet for them. And if he, you know, asked for something different, it's like, hey, we're busy, buddy. You're only here twice a year. We don't have the time or the space to accommodate anything for you. So, you know, I, I learned about that problem um, and just kind of, you know, more things like that, just how broken it was between the moment, you know, the animal on the land and the meat on the plate. And um, essentially, I just had a you know, through kind of years of getting to know more about this and as a customer, you know, sort of looking on the consumer end at limited access, um, you know, I just, I saw this problem and I kind of had like an aha moment of the solution 
that I really did think it was, you know, the fact that we, we started to lose craft butchery in our country. Um, as supermarkets and industrial, you know, slaughterhouses and processing happened, things started getting centralized, industrialized. They started showing up in boxes and, you know, butchers at the, at the butcher, at the supermarket didn't, wouldn't know what to do with a whole hog or a side of beef if they, if they were looking at it. Um, so really it seemed like the skill and the craft was lost and, and so were sort of the smaller specialized people in local supply chains. So, so yeah, so basically the, the short long story is that I had a crazy sort of epiphany moment, to be honest, um, where I thought, you know, maybe if I could learn butchery, I could have this skill that I could contribute and, and start to maybe learn other things about this supply chain. So, um, so yeah, so I, I tried to find a butcher that would train me. Uh, it was not easy to do because I did not have a professional food background um, and there just weren't that many options. It wasn't working. So instead I sought out a farmer um, thinking that maybe if I could work with a farmer, I could kind of learn more about these problems, you know, that I, I hope to eventually solve. So, so I apprenticed with a farmer for a year um, and then was able to identify a, a small, a butcher, um, an owner of a butcher shop in California, actually, who had a kind of small whole animal, you know, local butcher shop, which is the type of space that I was interested in. I, it, you know, it was basically a business that was solving a problem in its community, um, you know, giving custom butchery, buying directly from farmers. So I trained there um, and I learned those things. I came back to eventually came to not back to eventually came to Philadelphia um, for a job opportunity. And and after a couple of years of, of learning the trade and in doing so, learning more about what goes into the sourcing logistics, you know, there's so much that happens behind the scenes. You know, everybody thinks you just have to learn how to cut meat and, and then you can walk into my pretty butcher shop and buy a steak. But what people didn't realize was how much work I was doing behind the scenes to coordinate with the farmers to help, um, you know, do coordination with the slaughterhouse. How do we get the the now meat on trucks from the rural communities where they're grown and harvested to the urban communities where we're, you know, wanting to sell and eat meat. Um, so Primal Supply, you know, about kind of four or five years into my personal trajectory as a butchery, as a butcher, um, was really my answer to this problem that I kind of discovered five years earlier. And it was for Philadelphia, um, because you know we have a really rich history of butchery in the city, but like other things, even the butchers in the Italian market don't work with local farmers. They don't buy whole animals anymore. Um, and and in Philadelphia, five years ago, you still, if you wanted to buy local pasture raised meat that was transparently sourced, like you knew where it came from, you were probably going to head house and buying it out of frozen coolers at the farmers market. Um, so I was running a butcher shop uh, and market in Fishtown um, at the at Kensington Quarters at the time, and I was doing all the sourcing logistics work for one place, and it did it kind of you know my my sort of problem solution like second aha moment, I guess, was this idea that, well, heck, you know, I'm working with farmers, I'm working with slaughterhouses, I have trucking that's moving things from central Pennsylvania to the city. There's no reason why we couldn't have more, more, you know, like it, it's scalable. Those trucks were not full um, and that we could serve the city. So that that's why I started Primal Supply. The idea was to um, quite simply support local farmers, uh, kind of be the middle person to solve some of those problems for them. I, I coordinate with slaughterhouses I'm, I give them a market to sell their meat so that they can really focus on doing what they do best, which is farming. Um, and then, you know, we work on sourcing, butchery and market access, really, like trying to create market opportunities and educate customers about why they should care about and buy this meat. Right. And there's a lot of education to be done there. We're going to come back to you and, and find out more about the supply chain and building a supply chain. So, Omar, tell us a bit about the work of you three and particularly your area of practice. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we, as U3 Advisors, we are a, uh, a strategic advisory firm, uh, about 25 people based here, headquartered in Philadelphia with offices in New York and, uh, and in Boston. Basically, to describe our work, uh, we, we work at the intersection of anchor institutions, uh, that's a very heavy term uh, for uh, universities and hospitals, but we work at the intersections of the of anchor institutions, the real estate market, and the communities that surround these uh, anchor institutions. That's the space uh, in between that we find ourselves and are, are very effective uh, in. We work in most of the majority minority large cities in the country. 
Uh, I think uh, maybe Atlanta is the only uh, big uh, city that we haven't uh, yet uh, worked uh, there, or, although it's, uh, it's coming uh, soon, uh, hopefully. Uh, but uh, by nature of our area of uh, focus, we, are, we find ourselves working with mission-based institutions that are geographically located in urban, uh, dense uh, urban areas that, uh, and, and the communities around them are totally isolated from the institutions uh, uh, themselves. So our work is how to advance the mission of the institution. All of these institutions we work for are mission-based. They are not for-profit companies. They are mission-based. And they are anchors because they stay there. You don't find universities. Uh, sometimes you do, but in 95% in of the cases, they, uh, they are where they have been for the past hundreds of years. So how can we advance the mission of those institutions, but not at the expense of the communities that are around them, actually by strengthening the communities around them. And in doing so, we, we actually advance both the mission of the institution and the collective uh, public good uh, for, uh, for the city and the community uh, around. We, how do we do that? We, we had a very, uh, you know, I, uh, before I formed uh, U3, I uh, was the senior vice president at the University of Pennsylvania. And it became clear that we had as an institution, yes, we are an institution of teaching and of uh, providing um, health care and of doing a lot of research, but we are uh, an enterprise. And the whole idea of forming U3 was, can we look at uh, hospitals and universities not for their only education and medical um, uh, missions, but think of them as an enterprise. And when you think of, the, of, of these institutions, billions of dollars, uh, when you look at uh, higher education alone, not even the healthcare, um, in terms of land ownership, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres across the country, um, about um, uh, you know, uh, millions and millions of students, millions and millions of uh, employment. So if you think of them as an enterprise, how can that enterprise be redeployed, be rethought, reimagined to actually benefit the community around them? I mean, it's not, it's not a rocket science. Uh, we are the ones that uh, came up with the whole uh, idea, buy local, live local, hire local. Uh, the more you actually can have the employment in these institutions be from the neighborhood that they are uh, a part of, the more that uh, the dollars are spent around, the more that you actually are uh, have, in, have uh, employment that actually lives in the neighborhoods, the more you, there is no us versus them, the more there is actually a, a much more uh, coherent view of the public and the common good rather than uh, my, my interest against your, um, uh, your uh, interest. Where that creates quite a bit of a divide uh, between communities and, uh, and institutions. So uh, how do we do that? We do that with... Uh, all sorts of uh, interventions, we call them. Uh, we, we, we actually transact on behalf of the institutions and the real estate market in ways that actually do, uh, don't give uh, the institution um, a barrier between them and the neighborhoods they are in, but in fact to open the institutions up uh, to those neighborhoods. And in doing so, we actually transact in real estate. We, over the past uh, uh, six or so years, we have transacted for more than $2 billion on behalf of our, uh, of our uh, clients. But again, how to do that in ways that promote community interest rather than to actually uh, push back on, on that. And that's kind of the, the body of work that we, we all uh, uh, work in. As of my particular focus, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, the work that we do comes at very different scales. We can be in, uh, working with an institution on a parcel 
but we can also be working at the larger scale of an economic development for a whole region uh, or a whole district. And my, my area um, uh, of uh, interest is largely the vision and the strategy of actually how to find the common ground between communities, multiple institutions, and actually usher a new direction for the geography that we are working in for the benefit of everyone. Certainly the situation that you're describing and the notion of enterprise in a community was, is gonna resonate with a lot of folks at Temple. So thanks for that, we'll, we'll come back to that too. Diana, I wanna come back to you and, and um, just ask about, your, your book describes that the single family home came to be the American ideal, right? It was the thing that everyone would strive for. But what did you discover about the negative aspects of single family home ownership? Sure, yeah, so I think that there's, um, a way in which, yes, the single family home has been seen as an ideal. It is part of the American dream to have, you know, a home um, with a metaphorical, you know, white picket fence. Um, and I think that in many cases, um, there's so many good things um, that come with that, but that also have downsides, right? So um, people often talk about how great it is that home ownership um, provides people with um, an opportunity to grow their equity and to um, uh, build wealth. And that's great, but it also can turn housing into a commodity, which is really problematic in neighborhoods where people need access to housing and other people see it as sort of a commodity that can be speculated on. Um, and you see that in you know housing being flipped and so forth. Um, so that's problematic as an, just one example. Or um, you know, people often talk about single family homes as being um, great because they provide people with a lot of privacy. But uh, as a downside, a lot of that privacy can also um, increase people's sense of isolation and um, inability to um, build a community with their neighbors. Um, there's um, you know, certainly also other ways in which people talk about how homeowners are so um, invested in their neighborhoods and how great that is. Um, but that can also have a sort of nimbiest or not in my backyard tendency, which can lead to people um, excluding neighbors, um, excluding others from, uh, you know, moving into their neighborhoods or being very overly concerned perhaps about how property values could be um, potentially lowered by developments um, in their neighborhood that kind of don't fit the historical character of it. So I think that what I really tried to do in the book was to explore, um, you know, some of these assumptions that we have about um, how single family home ownership is kind of an unalloyed good. And that in fact, we really need to kind of reevaluate some of that and then think about, you know, what are some of these goals that we share as a society? Um, and whether single family homes and a home ownership model is really the best way to get there. Um, because, you know, home ownership in this country is um, primarily a benefit accrued to older white people. Um, that's primarily who, that's the majority of who homeowners are. And so younger, more diverse, um, uh, people who are interested in becoming homeowners are, um, are not able to access um, uh, some of that uh, housing um, and, um, and haven't had sort of the opportunities, same opportunities to build generational wealth um, that uh, they could apply towards housing. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how if our goal, say, is to create, you know, a vehicle for wealth creation in the U.S., um, are there other ways to do that beyond housing that wouldn't have some of these other destructive effects? Um, that's, you know, one question that I, I, I put out there. And then additionally, um, you know, I really think that it's important to look at how um, the sort of preponderance of single family housing and single family housing zoning has um, really become increasingly um, detached from the reality of, of where our demographics are headed um, right now. So again, this sort of idea of the single family home is being associated with families. Um, but a lot of um, people are getting married later or not married at all or having smaller families or are in 
um, interested in living in multi-generational households um, or are you know, increasingly this past year, people are taking up digital nomadism in a way that they hadn't before. Um, all of these various different types of um, living situations aren't quite accounted for in this type of housing. And so I think that we really need to think beyond the single family home and the home ownership model that goes along with it if we're going to, you know, really address both these issues of creating housing that fits people's needs, that's affordable and accessible to people, and that um, also is a more equitable um, wealth creation model. Um, your, your book is very provocative in getting us to reconsider something that we've just kind of taken for granted as if it always were the case. And you know, I'm gonna ask Heather about the, the supply chain and food supply, um, because that's also something we've always taken for granted. But the first wave of panic after COVID-19 hit was about access to food and exposing the fragility of our food supply chain. What impact do you think the pandemic has had on consumer behavior and consumer awareness? Um, so I guess, um, yeah, so I guess to kind of just comment a bit more on, on what happened to our food supply chain, it's, it was really interesting for me um, as someone who you know, I've kind of like, I've lived, I lived local <laughs> before I decided to build a business that was built on that. So I've, I've kind of long existed outside of the industrial food supply. Um, you know, what I, the work that I do, the way that I eat, the way that I feed my family is, is, is independent of that. And it's really, um, a lot of people kind of think even just in meat as a education, I have a lot of conversations, um, when t people talk about meat, anything from, the cost of it to the health benefits of it that like, you know, all meat is not the same in the way that it's raised and it's not in the way that it's processed. And in, you know, the, the last century, really like our, our food system and not just meat, all of it has just really, you know, it's been, it's been industrialized and it's been centralized, like small farms, you know, small producers, all of those things have kind of gone away to the larger factory version of them. And what we saw happen with the pandemic was that um, it was, it wasn't able to flex, you know? So when suddenly the grocery store shelves were empty and everyone says like, I don't understand why I'm reading articles that farmers are pouring milk down the drain or they're plowing vegetables under um, the ground or they're euthanizing animals, but but the grocery stores are empty. It's because, you know, some of those things were, were set on this massive industrial path to make their way into, you know, industrial food system, um, sorry, um, like the hospitality industry, you know, and, and it's packaged differently and it's portioned differently. And it's like, there's nothing about that where they could say, Hey, let's take this milk or this meat. And instead of making it be large format, let's take it small format and let's redirect it from the path that it was on into the grocery store. It was impossible. Um, and yet, you know, in, in smaller, and it doesn't, you know, we work on a very small scale, even just kind of in a mid, in a mid scale, there would be more flexibility and the ability to pivot um, you know, where you could say, hey, OK, uh, they don't we don't need this 10 pound food service pack. We could do 10 one pound packs and then we could sell them here instead. Um, so that's like, you know, on, on sort of in our smaller food system and supply chain, we had the ability to do that. You know, so so when this this sort of food panic and access issue happened, we became kind of like saviors for a lot of people in the community because we never ran out of anything. Um, and I could just I quite literally I actually to be totally honest, would have run out of meat because when the grocery stores emptied, customers who were never my customers came to us looking for just food. Um, and the reason why we had it was because meat that I was sourcing to supply to my restaurant customers, um, they all closed. And it was like, hey, no problem. You know what? We're not going to be selling whole briskets or 10 pound packages of ground beef to the restaurants anymore we suddenly have twice the inventory to sell to home cooks when they came calling. So, so we were quite able to, to flex in that way. And that was great. And the biggest shift that I've seen, and to be totally honest, I hope it continues is that we've really, um, you know, our, the trend in sort of like customer and customer behavior, human behavior has been towards convenience um, and access, you know, people, eat more until recently, <laughs> ate more in restaurants than they ever have. And if they weren't eating in restaurants, they were at least kind of, they were ordering takeout or, you know, sort of buying pre-made food. And 
I remember, I mean, like the statistics that you read, and I wish I'd kind of brushed up on them before I joined this, but things like the amount of money that people spend on food versus healthcare, you know, in the last decades has, has you know, disproportionately flipped. And the same thing about how much money that they'll spend eating at home rather than out in a restaurant, you know, so this idea of kind of like the cost of food and all these things got got kind of mixed up in the sense that like, you know, why will you spend, um, you know, you'll order takeout and it will cost you like $30 to get, I don't know, some food made with cheap ingredients that's kind of like one one meal for some people, some leftovers. But when you walk into my butcher shop, um, you're shocked at the cost of a chicken, um, you know, that was raised locally, but you can actually cook that into three meals that feeds an entire family and it was raised well and it's healthier. The meat itself is quite literally more nutrient dense and better for you. Um, so, the major shift that we've seen over the last year is that people suddenly are cooking and eating at home all the time. You know, the of so many people who might have, um, you know, got they work you you left for work in the morning. Maybe you cooked breakfast. Maybe you went into your coffee shop and grabbed something. You probably ordered or bought lunch out. Um, maybe when you got home at the end of your long day, you didn't feel like cooking, so you ordered takeout. And oh, then it's the weekend. Let's go out. You know, so you went to a restaurant. So. I think people were maybe, you know, you probably count on one hand the number of meals that people were cooking at home. Um, a busy, you know, busy working person, busy families, parents might have been cooking five meals at home in a week, and now they're cooking three meals a day. Yeah. Um, and I think just even we got so it's kind of an older story already, but in the first few months we got so much feedback um, and conversations with our customers about just sort of the discovery of cooking again, everything from how much they enjoyed it, how much they enjoyed cooking with their you know, families, kids, housemates, um, and this idea that maybe, you know, they, it's, we were sort of concerned that maybe folks would become cost conscious about our product as we're entering into, you know, potentially challenging economic times. But instead, they had this sort of revelation that most people were telling me that they found that they were spending less money on food. They were spending more money on ingredients than they had ever considered doing before. They were shopping more to cook at home. But ultimately, when they looked at like the cost of feeding themselves in the week, it was actually costing less. Um, so, you know, so we can start to encourage them to think about, um, you know, and the, and the work that I do is like, there's a lot of things that go into it. It's like, I care about the health of the land. I care about the health of the economy, but I also really care about the health of people. And, you know, you raise, you are what you eat in so many ways, you know? So it's like healthy animals, eating a healthy diet, having activity of being raised on pasture are inherently health, you know, is in healthier nutrient dense meat that you're going to eat yourself. Um, so if we can encourage people to think about spending a little bit more on those raw ingredients and bringing high quality food into their homes and then building back into their lives the time to cook and feed themselves and realizing that it's not like a hassle and an inconvenience it's actually something kind of enjoyable um, that's like a really positive shift in behavior um, and a return to something that people used to do you know it used to be you know even the tangential but the the hospitality industry and all the conversations that happen about you know we sort of saw the restaurant industry break um, I mean, it was it was broken, <laughs> but it sort of publicly broke um, under the stress of the pandemic. And when restaurants talk about opening again and how maybe they should, you know, think about more equitable pay or, you know, sort of the cost, uh, safer profit margins, you know, for true sustainability, they need people need to be willing to pay more to eat in restaurants. And if you look decades ago, you know, the average family went to the grocery store, spent money on on food, a lot more money that, you know, in the grand scheme of, of how they think about, you know, the the um, how, the, how they'll sort of spend their budget. Uh, they spent money on food, they cooked at home, and occasionally they dined out and that was special. And it was expensive and you did it rarely. And even even me itself, you know, I people I see there's a question about like access and insecure food access and insecurity. And that's Kind of a challenging topic for me. Um, it's something I care about deeply, but I am specifically committed to supporting and building back up a local supply chain that supports pasture-raised meat. So our meat is not, it is expensive. It's its the true, comparatively expensive, it's a tricky <laughs> subject. You know, the true cost of food is not cheap. Um, you know, industrial food is subsidized in a lot of ways. Um, and so our food is not subsidized and it's the really true cost of paying a farmer fairly, paying a processor, you know, paying the people who who touch it along the way in the supply chain just fairly for their work um, means that that end product is not going to be cheap. Um, so it's so it's tricky for us because I can't solve food access issues. I can I can solve access to local meat and support farmers in the process, but I can't sort of solve 
you know, food access and insecurity, because that's actually something that's related to the fact that we have this artificially inexpensive subsidized food chain. Um, so a much, much larger question for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So much so. So well, anyway, I hope to, I, this is like the best thing for me. You know, I, I really just like, I want to see people love cooking at home again and really being thoughtful and building that back into their lives. Right. Great. So uh, we have some questions that we want to sort of um, ask all of you to address from your various perspectives about food, housing, and, and community prosperity. But Omar, I'd like to start with you and sort of really bring it uh, local to Philadelphia. And from your perspective about building communities and using anchor institutions to build communities, what unique challenges face Philadelphians? Uh, you know, uh, maybe there's a uh, th there are two two levels of challenges. One is um, how how we perceive ourselves. In many ways, uh, Philadelphians still perceive themselves as uh, as a city as we were uh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. We are much more. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, we are younger. We are more diverse. We are more more cosmopolitan. And uh, the belief that actually we have an extremely uh, amazing quality of life where uh, many of our neighborhoods have both small businesses and have great housing stock. You know, uh, Diana talks about the single family home. You look at West Philadelphia, a neighborhood that was built uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It has the entire typology of housing that you can think about, from the mansions to the all the way to multifamily. Uh, so we have really amazing housing stock, amazing fabric for the city. I, I think sometimes we just, as Philadelphians, need to be thinking of our, ourselves as one of the, uh, the most desirable places uh, to live. As it relates to our work and how we see uh, Philadelphia, you know, 30, 40 percent of employment in the city is uh, among ads and meds. And that's the growth area. You know, uh, there are quite a bit of conversations that uh, fill the uh, news uh, cycles and uh, social media about uh, universities and uh, hospitals and not paying taxes and the like. But that, in my opinion, is really not the main issue. The main issue, these are uh, engines of uh, the economy. They are um, the, the uh, anchor institutions, uh, you know, hire a very diverse uh, labor force um, and, uh, and, uh, and diversity across all sorts of uh, indicators. So actually, the more we can facilitate how these institutions have a higher impact on the local economy in a coordinated way, the more I think we will be able to leverage their, uh, their enterprise for the benefit of the public. And I think that that's the opportunity and the challenge that we have. Great. Um, Diana, I, I was surprised recently to learn that Philadelphia has a, an unusually high number of homeowners, but in very old housing stock. Do you see this as an opportunity or, or an obstacle for Philadelphians to have safe, warm, dry, and healthy places to live? Um, I think it's both. I think, you know, certainly the fact that we do have this older housing stock, um, you know, in some cases, Philadelphia example, um, you know, some of those homes are, are sort of the gems of Philadelphia and having this older housing stock that, you know, has been restored in many cases um, is great. But I think, you know, on the other hand, it's also really challenging to have um, old housing stock in neighborhoods that where you know that house being restored is not going to be worth the money that you put into it. Um, and so no one is going to be restoring those older you know, home unless there is some kind of subsidy to do that, um, or there is some opportunity to flip the house for you know much more. So um, 
that it's not to say no one, but it, it, it takes a certain type of homeowner who's going to really put in the money to do that. So unless those neighborhoods kind of um, get to a point where the housing values merit that kind of investment in it, um, I think it's a real challenge to have that old housing stock. And I think also there's, you know, there's a whole host of um, kind of health born trigger, you know, house born triggers that are, you um, problematic for people's health um, that can cause asthma and other types of problems that are related to older housing stock um, where, you know, um, the, you know, HVAC equipment has not been improved where there's lead paint, et cetera. And that's a real problem throughout Philadelphia. And so, um, you know, I definitely know that there are some programs in place in the city to um, encourage um, home, you know, there's home loan programs to encourage homeowners to invest into their homes. Um, and there are some programs in coordination with CHOP and other hospitals to help um, sort of fix some of these health problems there um, that are caused by houses. But I think it's, you know, it, it, it can go either way. I mean, we love those old houses because they're, they create this amazing fabric that makes Philadelphia one of these amazing places to live. But it's also really hard in our um, our poorer neighborhoods. Interestingly, though, you know, you mentioned earlier how many uh, houses back in the day were boarding houses or mm -hmm. group housing. And, um, you know, maybe we'd see some of these houses go back to their original use, too. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I know also that the city is looking into ways of updating the zoning code to make that legal because, you know, right now, essentially sure. having an SRO or boarding house is not legal um, right. in the city pretty much. And a lot of that activity is going on illegally um, and in some cases, you know, in an unsafe manner. And so what we really should be doing is finding ways to update our code so that we're enabling these kinds of, you know, um, buildings that have continued to be, you know, boarding houses or could revert to that, um, you know, we should be enabling that and to let it come out of the shadows in a safe fashion so that um, people are able to access this kind of more affordable housing. So uh, as you all know, tonight's program and the Changemaker Challenge is really intended to inspire Philadelphians to promote positive social change. So we're going to wrap up our um, panel this evening asking each of you if you could encourage our listeners to take one action toward good for all, what would it be? And Heather, I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> um, okay, I, I, uh, it might seem obvious, um, but, but it is to truly uh, any, any time that you're able to quite literally, you know, buy, buy small and buy local. And I know that seems like an obvious thing, but the thing that you're doing is you're really voting with your dollars. And I talk to my customers about this all the time, that it's like every time that you buy a pound of ground beef from us, it's not just that you're supporting our small local business. It's that you're actually choosing not to support the larger industrial factory place that produced the pound of ground beef that you didn't buy. You know, so really like choose to put it where you want, put your dollars where you want businesses to grow. And, and in doing so, you're choosing not to put them into the sort of, you know, the unhealthy, the the industrialized, the, the businesses that don't really serve us or the communities that surround them. It's kind of interesting how many consumers don't really get that they can vote with their dollars. But it really yeah. matters. Yeah. How about you, Diana? What would you um, suggest people do for positive social change in Philly? So I would definitely say get educated on um, these various different issues around housing and communities. Um, so funny story is that I actually, the first time I ever met my husband was at a, a, a civic association meeting that Omar was presenting a development at, <laughs> this was like, you know, 13 years ago. Uh -huh. um, but that was one of the first things I did when I moved to Philly was to go to my local civic associations meetings and understand some of the issues. And frankly, a lot of my ideas about, you know, um, development were really different then than they are now. Um, but it was through a process of also hearing different sides and opinions on these kinds of issues that I really started to get a better understanding of it. So I would say engage in your community, find ways to get educated on these issues and don't just sort of assume that um, the way things that have been are the ways that they should be going forward um, and become an active participant in the city. 
Great, thank you. Omar, you get the last word. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to think of something uh, that, that applies across, but I will go for it and say, I encourage everybody to use public transit. I will become a SEPTA spokesperson here. I think uh, in many ways, uh, we live, as uh, Diana said, in segregated uh, communities, and uh, we, we lack uh, the, the empathy to the other. And public transit, you actually uh, stand in that trolley or, or subway car, and not everybody around you looks like you or from the same social uh, strata, and that's actually a good thing for you to, to, to understand the other you need to really interact and not in, be in your bubble of your car or wh whatever. So uh, a plug for SEPTA, use, use public transit. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear that promotion <laughs> plug there. <laughs> they need it. Um, so many thanks to our, our guests for so generously sharing your, your time and your insights. And to the Changemaker Challenge Planning Committee, who you haven't seen this evening, but they've been working behind the scenes, who made the evening possible. So it's Kezar Abdullah, Julie Carroll, Rebecca Collins, Erin McShay, Kerry Slade, Wayne Williams, Lynn Anderson, Lindsay Clark, Alan Kersner, Emma Shields, and Dylan Volpentesta. So uh, for all of our audience, you are now able to join any of these speakers. Diana, Omar, and Heather will all be moving into breakout rooms. And I hope you'll take advantage of small group chats for the next 30 minutes or so. Thank you all for joining us um, this evening and to our, our audience and partners in affecting positive social change in Philadelphia. Ride public transit, eat more <laughs> your community meetings. <laughs> Get involved. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.